The Lord be with you. Good day. And I welcome all of you to this worship service. If you are visiting with us from beyond this congregation, I want to say that you are especially welcome. All are welcome here. And we hope that we will be able to worship together again. During our worship this morning, we will be recognizing the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and remembering care for all creation, even in the time of pandemic. I also want to say that we are in conversation about what worship might look like when we are able to gather in this beautiful and sacred space again. That day will come. We will be together again. I also want to again thank our wonderful staff here at First Presbyterian. Each and every one of them continues to work and work at the highest level. And we could not make this happen without them, as we could not make it happen without you and for your continued support in all ways. I also want to lift up our wonderful technical engineer, Jacob Gooch, who each week makes this happen. And now I invite us all to prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. The organ music today is by three German composers, Reinberger, Schubert, and Handel. Uh, for the musical offering today, I'm thrilled to be joined by pianist uh, Claudia Thompson. I've known Claudia for 30 years, uh, close to 30 years. She's recently retired as professor of psychology at the College of Worcester. And I can honestly say that throughout my musical work with Claudia, she never fails to make me a better musician, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. Come all who would experience the love of God. Speak from the depths of your being. Speak, seek from the shadows of your longing. When we are laid low, God hears our prayers. God will lift up our spirits and fill us with joy. For God moves beyond our daily graves and refreshes us with the hope of abundant life today and in all our tomorrows. Come, let us worship our resurrection God. Let us pray. Gracious God, stay with us. Warm our hearts with the presence of your word and strengthen our resolve to extend the hospitality of your love and grace to those in need. Grant that we may see and in a seeing trust, and in trusting follow. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Living Lord, how often you come to us and we do not recognize you. In friends and strangers, we seek and offer kindness in words that make sense of our lives and the world around us. In living, enduring promises that we have all but forgotten, you come, O God, but our hearts are slow to see and experience you. Forgive us, we pray. Do not leave us, but stay with us and awaken us to your presence. Kindle within us deep and genuine love for you and for the sisters and brothers you give to us, even when they are strangers. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. Whether we hear a voice from the heavens or a still small voice in our hearts, listen carefully for the love of God. Look carefully to where that voice and that vision is present in our lives. Receive God's love and live in God's freedom. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the children's time. Today's Bible story is about the road to Emmaus, where some men were walking on the road talking about all life events that have happened, these huge life events. Jesus has returned and people have seen him and they're talking about it. And as they're talking about it, a strange man walks up to them and says, wait, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, are you the only person in the world that doesn't know what's going on? And so they fill him in. And so I thought that kind of, that story was kind of fitting right now because as they're talking about things, we are on their journey. They're going down this road and they are, their world is turned upside down, right? This person that they knew was dead is now alive and people are now seeing him walk around. And so as we are in our own little journeys on our own roads, the world that we knew has been flipped upside down. And there is some good and there is some bad, but I wanted to know from you guys, what are some good things or bad things about this current road that we're on that you have experienced? Because like the men on the road to Emmaus, they encountered Jesus and they didn't know it was Jesus. And so when we're in this time together, we're going to encounter some good things that may be Jesus saying, hey, I know this is a weird time. But look what's happening. So I wanted to hear from you about what your experience on this COVID-19 road that we're on right now and how that's become. So what things, good or bad, have you seen during this time? Homeschool is harder than I thought. What have you been surprised by these last few weeks? Um, probably that how slow all of these weeks are going. Those are some pretty crazy things. And I know there are going to be a lot more things that we encounter on this road together. But I know that Jesus is walking on this road with us. And that eventually it will become a road that will be our normal road together. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being with us on this journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This past Wednesday, April 22nd, the world recognized the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. We know that the Earth has been impinged upon 
and degraded seriously in these past years, these past decades. And it is our responsibility as people of faith to claim God's good creation and do what we can to keep it whole. And in some ways, perhaps this pandemic is part of the degradation. I invite you to join me in prayer as we pray for the earth. The international theme for this earth year is climate change. And so I pray that God's spirit will move within us and call us to action and call us to our responsibilities of care for all that God has created. Let us pray. Gracious God, on Earth Day we give thanks for signs of spring, melting snow or blooming flowers, singing robins or flowing streams. O Creator, we give you thanks and praise. This Earth Day, as we mostly see those signs through our windows or walking alone, we notice that the earth has some rest from human activity. Even while we worry and struggle with people around the world. O Creator, we learn in the midst of our concerns. Each Earth Day, we grieve the state of life and loss on the earth, deteriorating faster than ever before. We confess our selfish actions, taking, using what we want, not only what we need. Not all of our actions have brought you the honor we wish to bring, O Creator. We confess our sins with humble hearts. The earth cradles us in her sorrow. You, our source, grieve with her your love for us abiding always. You forgive and love us still. O Creator, we rest in the assurance of that love. This year we have seen how swiftly humans can adapt. Give us the eyes to see wisdom in this moment. Give us the courage to change our ways forever, to live responsibly, to advocate boldly, to honor and protect what you have created. O Creator, with your help, we will change our ways. Through the power of the Spirit, with Jesus as our guide, we close this prayer for our earth in the words that Jesus taught his disciples long ago to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power the glory forever. Amen.
The gospel lesson for the third Sunday of Easter in lectionary year A comes from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. And before I start to read this, I do want to share that uh, for me, this is the most compelling of the stories surrounding Jesus' resurrection. Uh, I do love the story we heard last week from the gospel according to John that has Mary coming early morning in the dark to find the tomb empty and to mistake Jesus for the gardener. But still in all, this road, so-called road to Emmaus uh, story comes comes alive most especially to me for its depth and um, gets me thinking, gets me thinking about things. So I invite you to join me as I begin with verse 13. Now on that same day, Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking, Jesus himself came near and went with him, with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? Jesus asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, Some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been known to them in the breaking of the bread. One of the things I like most about this story is that no one really knows where Emmaus was located. 
Some of the manuscripts say it was 60 stadia from Jerusalem. That would be about seven miles. But other manuscripts say it was 160 stadia, which would be about 18 miles. No historical or archaeological evidence points conclusively to any definitive location of a town called Emmaus. And so, instead of one more stop on the Holy Land pilgrimage tour, Emmaus becomes that mystical destination where anyone may be headed when life takes a turn for the worse, when opportunities are nowhere to be found, when possibilities become impossible, where hope fades. Emmaus is the place of broken dreams, shattered illusions, hard realities, reduced circumstances. In the story, the disciples of Jesus had run into the harsh fact of his crucifixion. They had risked their lives to associate with the one whom they thought would bring freedom to Israel, who would overthrow the despised Romans and restore the kingdom of David, as promised in Holy Scripture. But that one, Jesus of Nazareth, had been arrested and cruelly crucified. Oh, there were rumors several days after his death, that his tomb was empty. And some women were saying, he is alive. But the status quo remained. The promised liberation had not come to pass. Life would go on as usual. There was nothing new under the sun. And so two disciples left Jerusalem and made their way toward Emmaus walking away from the place of their dashed hopes to no place in particular. Only one disciple is given a name, Cleopas. The other's name might be my own or yours. On the way, they talked about what had happened during those last months. They decided they should have known, should have realized, that this Messiah's dreams would come to nothing. They had been ready to take on Rome, to mount another Maccabean revolt. But their rabbi, their spiritual leader, their would-be Messiah, was always talking about justice for the poor. He kept hanging around with tax collectors and other social outcasts. He valued widows' mites over the wealth of the successful. He spoke of gaining one's life by losing it. Was it any surprise that he would be rejected and then killed and cast out on the rubbish heap of life? With some Careful planning and strategic maneuvering, there might have been a resistance movement that could have restored Israel's glory. But instead, his associates were running scared and determined never to fall for empty promises again. Imagine the very idea of a messiah who would champion the poor and the weak and the brokenhearted. As the story goes, these two dejected ex-disciples encountered a stranger on that road to nowhere who met them in their hurt and their hopelessness. They did not know who he was, but they extended hospitality to him even as he challenged their flat, dead-end interpretations of the events of their lives. 
the stranger on the road turned out to be Jesus. And he retold their life experiences against the backdrop of their sacred stories in light of the faith they held dear. But though that salvation history, that doctrinal re-education received by the disciples on the road, awakened something in their hearts, in their minds, it did not help them see Jesus. Their religious training and traditions and teachings failed them in the midst of their deep disappointment, failed them when they abandoned any hope beyond what they could see. And yet, their hospitality, their openness to entertain one who was a stranger, an alien, opened the door to a new life and new possibilities. The disciples invited Jesus to join them for dinner, and it was then when the guest became the host. He took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. In the end, it was not a matter of believing the right things that opened their eyes. Their eyes were opened through an act of hospitality and a sharing in the mystical sacrament of blessed and broken bread. These two disciples recognized their Lord in action, not in word. Though the stories had warmed them, he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The miracle of the Emmaus Road is this. At the edges of hurt and hopelessness, Jesus is walking. God is there. On this third Sunday of Easter, we are separated from one another, sequestered in our own homes as we continue to practice social distancing as the best way to combat this COVID-19 virus that's still swirling around the world. But despite our isolation, I invite us to practice an act of imagination. For when we sit worshiping in our sanctuaries and chapels, we always have the communion table before us. Figuratively, in worship, we are always gathered together around the table, the Lord's table. So let us imagine that today, our coffee tables or our dining tables have become holy places where our spirits are gathered as one, even as our bodies are apart. We come with happy hearts or with heavy hearts, trailing the stuff of our lives, good and bad, knowing where we are going or having no idea where we are. We may be looking for Jesus, or maybe not. The wonder is that though we may not find what we are looking for, we will be found. We are fellow travelers joined around these tables, listening to the old stories, remembering a bit of bread and a sip from the cup, and being reminded that the bread of life, which is the bread of hope, and the cup of salvation, which is the cup of healing and wholeness, are given to me, are given to you, are given to all God's children, known 
and unknown. We are invited to be Easter people, to embody God's hope for the world in all we are and in all we do. We may not have the right words. We may not believe the right things. But the Lord will be made known in broken bread, in acts of kindness and compassion, in welcoming the strangers and the aliens among us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Biblical scholar John Dominic Crossan has made the observation about the story that we have heard today, the Emmaus story, that Emmaus is nowhere and Emmaus is everywhere. No one knows where the town was, and yet each and every day the opportunity presents itself for us to meet Jesus walking with us. Even in these threatening and uncertain times, this is a hope we can, we can claim. And we can claim that hope not only in this Easter season, but in all seasons. May our voices join to sing. Grant us your vision. Set all hearts burning that all creation with you may rise. May it be so for you and for me. And as you leave this worship, Go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, and that together, even apart, 
we are being empowered by Holy Spirit for faithful witness and loving service each one of our days. So may God's hope and peace, joy and love abide with you in these uncertain days and every day.